That's the signal. My neighbors all, and they should quite a car, so my car do them to want to go down the block. I'd like to acknowledge the territory um, from where I'm speaking. Um, I'm from Shawanaga First Nation, Ojibwe territory within the Robertson-Huron Treaty. And I'm over having, having a great life because I live out on Georgian Bay on an island almost all, all year round and have done that for 15 years. So uh, with the intent of uh, how great this meeting is today, I'm going to be very brief. So, I've just asked the uh, Navy spirits to come and take the goodness for us in all directions around the universe. As we're all sitting in this grand circle at this moment with each other. <clears throat> last night, <clears throat> excuse me, last night we had a great um, gift come to us. We had um, Grandmother Turtle, Mother Turtle come up the hill and as I say I live on an island so it is granite there's very little soil and that grandmother mother laid her eggs through the night so Rick and I are grandparents so what I want to say to you in the sharing there was so very little soil uh, where she laid her babies to come and that's um, a gift for us today that we need so little in order to do good work. So I'm inviting everyone to have an excellent journey and visiting with one another. How me go Marilyn. Thank you for getting us started in a, such a good way today. Thank you. And greetings, everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon for our virtual fires, our campsite, campfire chat on traditional ecological knowledge. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Allison Bishop. I'm the project manager for the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership, or the CRP. And for those of you who are learning about the CRP for the first time, we're currently in our second year and we are a seven year initiative. And our goal is to help advance Indigenous led conservation in the spirit of reconciliation and decolonization. This includes supporting the implementation of the Indigenous Circle of Experts recommendations from their 2018 report, We Rise Together. The CRP is jointly hosted by the Isak Olam Foundation, the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, and the University of Guelph. Together, we're establishing a Canada-wide network to catalyze communication, coordination, and reciprocal knowledge sharing amongst diverse partners, including Indigenous communities and environmental organizations working to support Indigenous-led conservation. We also seek to meet emerging research needs and build capacity to support the establishment of Indigenous protected and conserved areas and the transformation of existing protected areas to better align with Indigenous governance, knowledge systems, and law. So today's webinar conversation, um, it's a conversation, sorry, with professors Deborah McGregor and Danica Littlechild. Deborah McGregor is an Anishinaabe scholar from Whitefish River First Nation, Birch Island, Ontario, who joined York University's Osgoode Hall Law Faculty in 2015 as a cross appointee with the Faculty of Environmental Studies. Her research is focused on Indigenous knowledge systems and their various applications in diverse contexts, including water and environmental justice, environmental justice, forest policy and management, and sustainable development. Dr. McGregor is leading the knowledge systems research stream of the CRP. And Danica Littlechild is a member of the Ermanskin Cree Nation in Treaty No. 6 territory in Alberta. Danica is an assistant professor in the Department of Law and Legal Studies at Carleton University's Faculty of Public Affairs. A former practicing lawyer in Alberta, her practice included Indigenous laws and legal orders, as well as Canadian laws and policies pertaining to environment, water, conservation and protected areas, health, international law and human rights. Danica served as the co-chair for the Indigenous Circle of Experts under the Pathway to Target One. And Danica served for a term as the Vice President of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO, in addition to a decade-long history of service to the CCU UNESCO. Danica is the recipient of the 
Guayo Award for Justice and Human Rights for the, from the Institute for the Advancement of Aboriginal Women in Alberta, as well as the Alberta Aboriginal Role Models Award for Justice. And Danica is leading the ethical space research stream for the CRP. And finally, Elder Marilyn Capriel just introduced herself. Uh, Elder Marilyn is co-hosting the campfire discussion with us today and is a founding member of the CRP's Elders Lodge and has been really instrumental in providing guidance for us this past year as we have been building the foundations in our governance model for the partnership. Marilyn was raised on the waters of Georgian Bay where she's joining us from today. Throughout her life, she's been an active volunteer. For many years, she was the president of the Circle of Directors for Name Res, a shelter for Indigenous men in Toronto. She's also involved with the Georgian Bay Biosphere Reserve and is a member of the Indigenous Circle for the Canadian Biosphere Reserves Association. So thanks to all three of you for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. And just so you know, today I'm going to be in the background helping facilitate the Q&A session a little bit later in today's event. So if you have a question that you would like to ask and you've joined us from a computer, feel free to write it in the chat box on Zoom and I'll kind of create a list of questions for later. Um, but if you've joined us from phone, um, by phone, don't worry, we'll make a point of asking um, those of you on the phone if you have any questions a little bit later on too. So thank you. And with that, I turn it over to Marilyn. Oh, Marilyn, you might be on mute there again. I was. <laughs> um, today, um, we have some grand young ladies. And in our culture, uh, the things that we teach from our ancestors that flows down to our young people, and it's called a transfer of knowledge. And back in the day, I think when the terms came out, Deborah, we were all together up in Sault Ste. Marie, sitting in how we are going to define our knowledge systems and the, the sharing and the transferring and that. And um, I cannot remember how many years ago it was. We were both young ladies then. Um, and that is how the establishment of the tech came out. How could it best uh, describe uh, what we give an acronym today is to COI, and that's Creator's Original Instruction. So that is what the young people and the elders came up with. And many people who guided us in, in this transference of knowledge um, have passed and they've left that legacy for us to continue to do that work. And I'm very proud that today we sit with two mastered young women of our nations from the east to the west. So uh, we're saying that I think they have dynamics to share with us. So ladies, miigwech. Thank you, uh, I guess I'll start. Um, so the way that uh, we tried to structure our, our comments is to just start off with uh, uh, Danica and I talking about um, where we come from and how we're approaching this topic and, and Marilyn provided a little bit of insight there um, and then get into uh, what how we understand uh, traditional ecological knowledge or I prefer to say indigenous knowledge systems and we'll explain why um, and then what some of the challenges were where opportunities are things that people can do so they kind of leave uh, the session today with some ideas as opposed to feeling overwhelmed <laughs> it's the educator in us that tries to <laughs> tries to make it uh, a, a little bit of a smoother transition from this into the real world first i wanted to thank uh, marilyn for that opening um and everybody for joining us uh, on a actually extremely hot day so maybe we don't mind being inside right now uh getting a break from uh, uh from the heat and and also allison for organizing because it always is a lot of work behind the scenes to organize anything and coordinate um, and, uh, and the project for, for having us and everybody, again, for signing up on, on short notice. We know also this is uh, Indigenous History Month in June. Uh, yesterday was uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day. So in part, this is uh, a celebration of that by speaking of, you know, having an opportunity to talk about our knowledge um, and how it's very relevant um, in contemporary times and into the future. It's not just history. So hopefully, uh, we can shed light on that. So, um, so the first thing was just to 
for me to talk about the perspective that um, that I bring to this. Um, so fortunately for me, for many years, I had the opportunity, like I was thinking about it this morning as I was preparing my notes and, um, and it's, I think about 20 years, like in terms professionally, in terms of working with First Nations uh, in this area. Um, and a lot of it had to do with um, Great Lakes work, how to, the involvement of Indigenous peoples in those processes, particularly First Nations. I, I did a lot of work with Chiefs of Ontario and, and also uh, traditional knowledge. This would be something that people would bring up. Okay, we want our knowledge to be part of these processes. It's not just involvement of Indigenous people, but our knowledge is on par uh, with other knowledges that are used in decision making um, and governance. And, you know, since then it's been thinking about what that means in a number of different areas, environmental assessment and water governance. So, uh, so that's really sort of um, the professional work that I've done in First Nations. Um, the real gift there has been what I've learned from the uh, elders, the grandmothers, the grandfathers, the traditional knowledge holders, and the practitioners, people who are, are, who are doing stuff out there as we speak. Um, and so I don't like to claim their knowledge. So whatever insights I have, I have to give credit to them. Uh, and I feel like my job as an educator is just to then figure out how I'm going to share that with other people uh, in other contexts. So it's not, it's not my knowledge. It's something that I've learned from other people and uh, have opportunities uh, opportunities to share with others. Um, I also had the experience of a completely different perspective of looking at it from a, a Government of Canada perspective. I worked for Environment Canada for 10 years and traditional ecological knowledge was one of my files. How do we, it was showing up in Canadian legislation, how does this become a reality in terms of the work that managers and policy people, um, biologists, uh, like how do they make this real in the work that they do was part of uh, what I had to try to help people um, figure out and a completely different insights into how traditional knowledge or tech or indigenous knowledge systems are um, conceptualized there. So looking at it from that kind of policy perspective. Um, as a scholar, I find a lot of my work has been trying to get people to just understand what traditional knowledge is um, and then how it can be applied in various contexts. Um, and so, and probably the center of how I approach that is that Indigenous knowledge systems, traditional knowledge is not new. It's new in policy circles, legislation circles internationally, and at every level, but uh, it seems like somebody else is, needs to be on mute, or is that just me? Okay. Interfere it somewhere. Okay, anyway. Then. So, okay. <laughs> oh. I see a very lovely picture of Marilyn, but <laughs> so, so to me, I guess uh, just to try to summarize is the way that I look at it is Indigenous solid systems um, were important to Indigenous peoples for thousands of years. It's not new to Indigenous peoples at all. It's new to other peoples more recently over the last few decades, but it's not new to Indigenous peoples and it can stand on its own. Um, it's sort of usually the message that I, uh, that I try to convey. Um, embracing or working with indigenous peoples and their knowledge systems doesn't mean that you're rejecting science that's a very common uh perception that i got a lot of throughout my career um was people automatically think that's what you're doing i'm like no that's not what we're saying at all if we're talking about this and um and want to respect this um i think to be to be perfectly like to be very honest also i also recognize my limitations i'm not a fluent speaker uh, of Anishinaabewin and so I'm really limited in terms of what I can learn. I'm in circles where that's all people are speaking. Um, by the end of the day I can kind of figure it out because I grew up with fluent speakers but I wasn't taught. Um, so I have my limitations in terms of the work that I do um, in terms of really being able to understand what's being conveyed a lot of the times and and then in terms of my limitations and then sharing it uh, sharing it with others. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop there. So those are the perspectives that I'm coming from and maybe that will make a difference in terms of the questions that you're asking. But I'll turn it over to, to Danica um, to talk about where she's coming from before we, uh, before we actually say, okay, what do we understand Indigenous knowledge systems to be? So thank you for your patience in that. I can go on about this because I taught a whole course in this for many years at U of T and I don't have 12 weeks to explain everything to you. So I know I'm kind of jumping through things uh, quickly. So thank you for that. Thanks, Deb. Um, 
Tansa toya kakio, kena naskom tenua ota pentumiak. Hi, hi, Marilyn, for opening uh, our session. And my thanks to Allison for um, help, helping to shepherd us through our conversation today. And I thank all of you for participating and being interested in what we have to say about this topic. Um, yes, in terms of positionality, I guess um, I would say that um, I ha I'm in kind of an interesting space right now because I practiced law for a few decades in, in, uh, in Alberta and and nationally and internationally, um, and um, in that time, really just focused all my energy on um, lifting up and and supporting the work of Indigenous peoples, um, and and now I've taken on this new role as a professor at, in an, in a in a large university, and so it's been so interesting to sort of. Um, have the history and the experience of um, of how knowledge of Indigenous peoples has been treated in terms of advocacy um, of Indigenous peoples in, in the few decades that I practiced law, and now how I see it treated in the context of the academy, um, in the context of of research and and how people are sort of thinking about this issue um, as um, as uh, as a topic, so to speak. Um, and so for me, I share so much of what Deb has summarized, so I don't want to repeat that, but um, I do want to say that, um, that I, uh, I really focused a lot of my energy over these past number of years in, um, in lifting up and trying to elevate um, the knowledge holders and the elders and the leaders uh, from our indigenous nations and communities um, who, uh, who deserve to be recognized appropriately and, and adequately in the context of how we interact as indigenous and non-indigenous peoples in the context of how we uh, are, are connected to and behave in relation to Mother Earth um, and in regards to our sort of ethic um, moving forward. Uh, and so that's where a lot of my interest in the, um, in the CRP as well as in the idea and concept of ethical space comes from. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit more to ethical space later in our conversation, um, but I think um, that sort of um, a broad strokes um, idea of of where I've where I'm coming from in terms of um, the work that I've done though so far. So, in in terms of um, what is Indigenous knowledge systems, that's probably the million dollar question, maybe even worth more than that with the rate of inflation and everything else. But um, so it's always one of the questions that people people want to want to know. Um, what I will say is people have different understandings because there's a huge diversity of Indigenous peoples. And when it's rooted in language and it comes from the land and people's culture and identity, it's going to be different because we're not all the same. Um, although I will say there are common um, principles, which you see in Indigenous International Declaration and in UNDRIP, where in Indigenous peoples from all over the world have gotten together and decided on some things. Um, but the way that, it's kind of weird because I started in this field when people were just starting to figure it out. Um, and it's not a term that, what, that came from Indigenous communities because we have our own words and our own language for this. It's like policy circles, governance. And I remember, because I have to pay homage to Henry Lickers, who was at this for decades, probably five or more. And and the way that we, part of it was indigenous people were reacting to how other people were conceptualizing this. And he, I just, I'll never forget this. He called it, it's not the nuts and berries approach. So the way that initially people were approaching indigenous solid systems was this data and information that was going to be extracted from indigenous communities, started, put in a report, put on a map or something, or a database. But it's not just where do people pick berries and where do they gather nuts? That's sort of what he was calling it. It was a whole system of knowledge. It's a whole system that's built into the society 
and meant to support the goals of the society, which for the Anishinaabeg is to support life. So just like, because we're in the academy, most of us, that's a whole system of knowledge. So our knowledge is part of the system with laws and governance and everything else that supports it. So it's very hard to take pieces of it and stick it into other people's societies and their goals uh, that, that, they may, that may or may not be shared with, uh, with Indigenous peoples. So it's important to understand it as what it's not, which is not the nuts and berries. It is that tiny part of it, but not all of it. It's part of this whole system of how a society functions and how a society transforms and changes over time to meet its uh, challenges so it doesn't, it doesn't stay static. So I'm not gonna get into the whole history of it because there's lots to say about that, but I did want to uh, acknowledge that this challenge that Henry had all the time, and that would be one of the first things he'd say, it's not the nuts and berries approach <laughs> to, uh, to traditional knowledge. Um, the other thing I'll say about it is, um, it's not really appropriate to remove it from the people. That's where it lies. It lies in the community. It lies in, um, it lies in the everyday. Indigenous languages tend to be verb-based. So it's when you're doing it is when traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge is happening. Um, I could wheel around in my chair and pull out some reports and say these reports that talk about traditional knowledge is actually not traditional knowledge itself, the representations of it. Um, so it's important that I just recognize that it lives within the people and it's meant to support the people and people are quite happy to share it when they don't think the best decisions are being made for, uh, for the earth um, that they rely on for, for their livelihood um, and for the future. The other part that's important to say is that um, you can't really protect Indigenous knowledge or have access to Indigenous knowledge unless you're willing to protect and support people, because that's where it lies. A lot of the times you see a lot of narrative, we want to include traditional knowledge. I go, well, you can't do that unless you're talking to people. We want to protect traditional knowledge. Well, you can't do that unless you protect people and their rights and their livelihood. Um, and that's a lot of that's laid out in treaty relationships or in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So those are some things that get people to think about traditional knowledge, tech or indigenous knowledge systems in a different way than, okay, we need this information about fever for recovery species or turtles. It's more than data. Um, tends to be the common way that people relate to people external to indigenous communities, the common way uh, by default, a lot of the times, because of this, the dominance of science uh, and how they approach questions relating to, to nature. So we, um, so you have to think way beyond that. It, it's that, but it's like way more than that. Um, and, and it's part of systems and it's in the people and you have to protect people. You can't really get traditional knowledge. A lot of people try and they've developed methods to try to do so without the people. Um, so I think that's all I'll say about that, other than um, one of the, the reasons why traditional knowledge remains really important to us, because it enabled us to survive genocide uh, and colonialization, colonization historical and ongoing. Um, and it's, it's basically needed for our future. Um, youth uh, really would like access to and to learn uh, this knowledge so that they can then live up to their responsibilities to ensure the continuance uh, of life. So that's not generally what you're going to see when you Google definition of traditional ecological knowledge, which tends to see it only as knowledge, as a product, a commodity. Um, it's, it's way more than that from uh, an Indigenous or I'll speak from an Ishabic perspective, uh, an Ishabic perspective. So I'll stop there. Yeah, I think there's so much value in talking about um, and emphasizing the connection between knowledge and real living people. Um, I think that has been sort of, to my mind, um, one of the hurdles that we potentially are still sort of grappling with in terms of sort of inter-societal relations. Um, we have treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements um, between and amongst Indigenous peoples, as well as between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Um, and, and we have emerging standards, um, uh, you know, coming out of the conservation movement and how it's being responsive or trying to be responsive to Indigenous peoples. Um, we, and that's nationally, internationally, regionally. Um, and we also have, 
the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which I think is really um, foundational in the, in the sense that it represents the minimum standards of rights of Indigenous peoples. And there's a lot in the UN DEC that references knowledge. And I think the UN DEC and the way that it was negotiated, we have to remember that it was also negotiated over a 20 or 30 year period. During an, an era when we were still thinking of knowledge of Indigenous peoples as information and not as a system. Um, as Deb had mentioned. And so I think for me, um, what is really important for us to do and, and to be mindful about in the work that we can, and, and how we conduct our work and how we, um, how we co-create our relationships is that we, um, we do our best to live with the discomfort and the inconvenience of, of elevating a system and not information. Um, and, and I think that that's sort of a conscientious choice that we all have to sort of make in the way that we engage with one another in our, in our initiatives, in our activities, in our research projects. Um, we just have to be so mindful of, of ensuring that we really are elevating um, the knowledge systems and how knowledge fits into the larger systems of Indigenous peoples. Um, and to me, that's, um, that's one of the big um, major steps that I don't think we've really completed or, or taken in any kind of substantive way. Because I think, I think that default script that was developed over decades, um, as Deb was mentioning, about what TEK is or what traditional knowledge is, is still very, very pervasive. And I would argue that many um, really good intentioned well-tuned in people actually still speak according to that script. And so I think it's, it's really hard to shake it. Um, it's really hard to shake that idea that indigenous knowledge is not just information, but that it is indeed part of indigenous systems that if we want to be fully respectful of them, we do have to be willing to engage with indigenous peoples as experts of themselves and as um, bona fide holders of their, of their own knowledge. Um, and sometimes I think that is kind of still a struggle. So I'm really hopeful for the future because I think a lot of people have indicated a willingness to start to move in that direction. Uh, I think what I would like to see is sort of more tangible markers that that transition is happening. So I've, I've heard a lot of discourse but I see less um, movement in terms of formalized um, and, and foundational systems change um, in order to, to make that transition. Thank you, Danica. Um, so the, so we wanna, so people can ask questions. You can start putting them onto the chat box with Zoom and then Allison will start to monitor them if you're interested in sort of our work and how we how we think about this this whole topic in in the first place um we want to move into sort of what we see as sort of being the key challenges and the reason for that is in canada we've been at this for at least four decades probably internationally a bit longer since the world conservation strategy actually before that in the 1970s because people needed traditional knowledge as part of the uh, land use and occupancy studies and traditional knowledge and establishing um title but here we are kind of asking ourselves kind of the same questions. So what is happening? Um, but I think in, in my experience, because I've, I've worked in these contexts where a lot of times we'd be invited to Ottawa to other contexts to, to forums and we'd be constantly being asked always the same question. How can we, or as people are moving away from integrate, but it was like, how can we integrate traditional knowledge into whatever? You can fill in the blank to whatever it is. And it was always, how Indigenous peoples would have to try to contort themselves to fit into somebody else's boxes all the time, as opposed to the powers that be around the boxes that needed to have traditional knowledge trying to understand Indigenous knowledge systems um, on its own terms. So that's, um, strangely enough, a lot of those questions are still the same. <laughs> uh, I, I think what's different now, when, as I think about the Indigenous knowledge strategy that the 
uh, federal government's trying to develop, that they're trying to sort out through the impact uh, assessment process, um, is they're still kind of asking a lot of those same questions from like four decades ago, three decades ago. It's still, it's st one of the big challenges is still how are we going to fit in traditional knowledge into these other processes? And as we said earlier, that's not really possible because it's in people and it's in communities and you have to involve uh, people in a meaningful way, not just when it's convenient, taking people's knowledge and shuffling off and doing something else with it than, um, than it was uh, originally intended. So we need to ask ourselves different questions. We need a different paradigm for how we approach, uh, approach the work that we do. Um, so one of the things that, again, as I was thinking about this says, if one of the challenges is fundamentally about how Indigenous peoples are treated in Canada. So if that doesn't actually improve, um, it's very hard to engage Indigenous knowledge. Now we're in this time of opportunity right now because of the um, anti-racism activism going on around the world and uh, in Canada and the United States, that's an opportunity to begin to start to shift to change the, the relationship. I mean, there's been other catalysts in Canada through the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, through Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Murdered, Missing and Indigenous Women uh, and Girls, they've laid out already the recommendations for how to do this. So you really need to, that needs to fundamentally change. You can't continue to treat Indigenous peoples badly and then say, could you share your tech? Like, uh, like it's just, a very bizarre thing to even like wrap your head around, but that's sort of how Indigenous peoples experience this um, a lot of the time. So we need to fundamentally kind of address uh, those kind of questions. Um, so a lot of the times, again, it's just trying to fit it into these other frameworks. Uh, again, I can wheel around in my chair, although I'll probably knock my computer over and everything else on my desk and pull out other documents that said, so early on in the field, people said things like wrote reports, um, uncritique that said things like we're going to tap into traditional knowledge we're going to capture traditional knowledge we're going to harvest traditional knowledge uh how the utility of traditional knowledge like these are all the stuff coming out in the 80s and 90s that i have sitting on my shelf since i've been sort of involved in this field for some time so it's always like what does it mean to other people other than to ourselves you know like people weren't really uh asking those kind of questions I'm a researcher, so I always think if you don't ask the right questions, you're not going to really get, <laughs> you're not really going to get like solutions or uh, the kind of answers that we think that we might, um, that we might need. I think uh, I'll end this part by saying um, the academy has a big part in how, what the field looks like, because a lot of the methods that are developed for how you do Indigenous knowledge research or traditional knowledge research are very extractive. We just try to figure out the most ethical ways of getting this from communities and people. That has to change. It has to switch to different kind of uh, frameworks for how you engage with people, the kind of questions that you ask. How does this actually benefit indigenous communities? Um, so, so a lot of those methods actually have to change. And I would advocate for um, indigenous methods themselves, which would again be diverse across the country. How Inuit would do this would be different than Mi'kmaq, than Anishinaabek, because we have different understanding than the way that we governed our own knowledge for thousands of years. Um, and I don't think Indigenous knowledge systems can be really fully understood without knowing Indigenous laws, Indigenous governance, because we did do that. That's most of the history. That's thousands of years compared to the last few decades of people's interest in, in this topic, putting it into legislation or policy, and not really quite knowing what that means when you do it. Um, so there's still, strangely enough, that fundamental kind of, um, lack of understanding and then I think with this I'll just I'll just share a really quick uh, it was I call it a teaching but something that I learned from elders when I first started doing this work um, they were a bit skeptical of this term called tech because they're like what is that anyway right I'm like uh, trying to explain what it is to people who think in the language and who live this every day and once they kind of knew what what you know external agencies were interested in, whether they were government, ENGOs, researchers, they just said, it's not a quick fix for other people's problems. That's not how it works. I'll never forget that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and that you actually have to work hard. Like it's a lifelong process. There's no like quick fix answer to things. Like it's continual discussion and negotiation among peoples. Like it's, it's uh, 
um, and it's something that you continually have to work at. So the relationship becomes paramount because you have to be able to get through the ups and downs, the difficult times and the, and the good times. So I'll leave you with that because it's stuck with me all these years that it's not a quick fix. Um, and therefore, like it's not appropriate to romanticize the knowledge because it's actually really hard work. So I'll leave it there and, and look forward to Danica's remarks. Yeah, so, um, so I think um, one of the things that we decided to try to highlight at this point in the talk are some of the challenges that we see. And I think one of the more controversial questions that I could think of was whether the conservation movement was ready for Indigenous knowledge systems. Um, and, and I think asking that question is, is useful. And I don't know that it's really that controversial because as a matter of fact, I know many ENGOs within the conservation movement that have been very explicit about asking themselves that question and have really um, made sincere efforts towards trying to engage with various Indigenous peoples to, um, to find the path forward for their organizations. Um, I think part of it is, um, part of it is sort of, um, you know, a sort of decolonization um, process, um, as well as um, sort of um, us trying to collectively um, become critical thinkers um, and sort of lateral thinkers around how we can move forward together um, through some of the challenges that we're facing right now. And um, I think the whole reconciliation narrative was a useful term for people to hang their hat on in terms of, um, you know, what would be like um, broadly acceptable, um, even in sort of the public perspective about how to move forward in engaging with Indigenous knowledge, whether you were an ENGO or a university or what have you. Uh, I think a lot of people have sort of latched onto that narrative. Um, I think um, where things can become tricky is when we're not um, specific enough um, in our own positionality as well as in um, ensuring that, uh, that we truly are respecting uh, the folks that we're engaging with and that we're, and that we're doing it in a substantive way and not in sort of a rote way. Um, I think one of the issues is that we, as a society, um, enjoy symbolic acts, um, which can be important steps forward, but may not provide us with a substantive transformation that I think is necessary. Um, so it's very important, for example, to do land acknowledgements. And I love reading in the chats, the different people who have posted have all done acknowledgements of where they're posting from, which I think is so amazing and really important. Um, and those things are important um, to do, um, but I don't think they carry us sort of a significant distance. I think what they are is, um, is precisely that, just sort of an acknowledgement of position, um, but they don't um, necessarily change relationship. And um, I loved something that Hayden King said about that. He said, you know, I'd be less interested in land acknowledgements from people and more interested in hearing what they're doing with the indigenous folks um, uh, of the territory that they're in. So if you work with an ENGO, instead of saying like, I am in the land of so-and-so, you would say, I'm in the land of so-and-so, and these are the projects that we have committed ourselves to uh, work towards in lifting these nations up or something along those lines. I thought that was really an amazing gesture. And to me, that sort of takes the land acknowledgements a step further. And so I think in terms of this overarching question that I had about whether the conservation movement is ready for indigenous knowledge systems, I think it's about being ready to, um, to genuinely, um, not just make space for Indigenous peoples, which I think has been sort of the, the de default approach of the best of, of, of those who are working towards this, um, but also to sort of just understand that these systems exist whether or not you recognize them. 
and that because they exist, whether or not you recognize them, it's about just being willing to allow those systems to function in relation to you without feeling like you have to interfere with them or translate them or even like fully understand or master them in order for a good relationship to proceed. Um, so another example I'll give you is I was talking to somebody from the conservation movement once um, this earlier this year, and she said, you know, I don't really want to talk about indigenous systems because I don't know enough about them to speak to them. And I said, well, that's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you to be knowledgeable enough about indigenous systems that you can say that you have some kind of expertise about them. In fact, that's the very opposite of what I'm asking you to do. I don't think um, we're asking our allies or partners to try to learn what we know. That's not the point. The point is um, for our allies and partners to say, these are the knowledge holders and they know about their own systems the way I know about my system. Um, and the way I am recognized as an expert in my field, they must be recognized as experts of their knowledge. Um, and as such, that's, um, that there is a different kind of respect that takes the place of, um, of the kinds of approaches that we've seen in the past, um, where, um, where it was usually more about what was useful in the moment about those particular knowledge systems um, for the for the mainstream, if I can call it that, or for the conservation movement, for example. Um, I think the other thing to try to remember here is that really um, we are we are kind of moving at the speed of light, <laughs> in the sense that we are grappling not just with this sort of overarching question about you know um, indigenous knowledge in the context of conservation. But we're also just sort of um, more broadly struggling with basically what is appropriate recognition. We are still struggling with that. Um, you know, a lot of people are not satisfied with Canadian jurisprudence. A lot of people are not satisfied even with the minimum standards set out in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And even those standards are not being properly implemented. Um, or, or they're being spoken to, but they don't actually function the way they were intended to. And, and so the result of that is situations like um, what are being faced by indigenous peoples who are trying to protect you know, their territories from more incursions, um, more development like pipelines, who are being criminalized um, for, um, for being land defenders and water defenders um, who are in fact facing um, you know, smear campaigns, death threats. I mean, it really does get pretty extreme still. And so even though in the conservation movement, it can feel you know, that, that we are so much further past that, um, we can't really function in a bubble either. Like we have to recognize the context in which we're working when it comes to indigenous peoples and their knowledge. And the fact that so many indigenous peoples are under such significant duress um, under such significant pressure. Um, it sort of brings to my mind my own nation, um, Erminskin, Neosquayak, and Muskwachis. I can tell you that, um, you know, in terms of like TEK or traditional knowledge, almost all of the pressure on my nation comes from, comes in the form of pressure on what's called the consultation department. So basically like a few people from the nation who are trying to respond to um, extreme requests from proponents and from governments for projects that they just don't have the capacity to respond to, but are expected to respond to um, so that there can be a box checked that they were consulted and that the project can move forward because they had their TEK gathered because they sent so-and-so out to map a certain place or space for a day or two. And so this has sort of been like um, the, the normal routine in my nation. I can't speak to a lot of other nations, but when that becomes the normal routine, the connection that people have in their minds to what traditional knowledge is, is very much intrinsically tied to whatever definition has been prescribed by proponents, 
private sector people and, um, and uh, non-Indigenous governments. And so I think, you know, ensuring that we um, also maintain our mindfulness of context is hugely important. And when we try to co-create relationships that ignore that context, um, I think it's a huge disservice to ourselves and it's actually even maybe even backing off on the mandate that's been adopted to try to, um, even if you want to look at the old reconciliation narrative, which I think is now old, um, you know, if you wanted to look at that, um, even it's, it's a huge um, step back from that even. And so I think, um, I think it's really important that people understand, especially within the conservation movement, I've seen it to be sort of a struggle for folks to understand how intrinsically tied these questions are to rights of indigenous peoples. Um, and for many years, that's been to me one of the major controversies of sort of indigenous peoples rights and environment because so much of the time we're being told, look, let's deal with the technical issue and we'll deal with the rights issue some other time, like trying to separate them out as if somehow the, they don't impact each other enough to 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 be uh, to to require um, contiguous consideration, like consideration of both at the same time. And I think um, that tendency has to be abandoned. We have to conscientiously abandon the idea that we don't have to think about rights of indigenous peoples in the context of things like conservation, stewardship. Um, and and um, indigenous knowledge systems um, being used and accessed. Um, we absolutely must be willing to, um, to have those conversations. And that can be really uh, intimidating for people who have never had to do that in the context of their careers. If they're used to talking about it from a purely, say, scientific perspective, where um, individual rights or co even collectively held rights, especially collectively held rights, have never really been part of the, the normal conversation, like they're not regular vocabulary. Um, but I think we have to just try to start making it regular vocabulary. And, and I think so, so overcoming that challenge of readiness, um, uh, I think requires a lot of, of self-education as well. And I, and I think we have to be really careful even about that, about how do we go about like sort of educating ourselves about systems of indigenous peoples. Because I think um, the, the other sort of default um, um, script that has developed is, is where, um, is where um, indigenous peoples um, perspectives and voices are expected to be contributed on sort of like a pro bono um, volunteer basis um, because our, our ENGO allies or, or partners or our government partners or allies or even the private sector um, feels that it would be beneficial, but they don't actually want to, um, they don't actually want to engage in it in any more substantive way than, than giving a little honorarium or, <laughs> or you know, um, uh, uh, asking somebody to fly somewhere for free to, for a few days to, to give their perspective on their organization. So, so I, think, um, I think we have to sort of, as I mentioned at, this, at the start of my intervention here, uh, to, to be critical thinkers, to be lateral thinkers, and, and to do a lot of the work internally so that we can get ready um, now, so we can just continuously be ready um, for each other. And I think similarly, Indigenous peoples um, also have work to do. But for Indigenous peoples, we're under so much more pressure um, from so many other factors that it's really difficult for us, for example, to sit down and educate ourselves on you know, um, the whole history of conservation, for example, when an Indigenous nation is engaging in the movement, um, or um, to um, adequately understand um, all of the different overlapping standards that exist, international, regional, provincial, territorial. There's so many, um, so many different, different, um, different standards and constraints that people are working within. And so I think, um, I think it's, it's definitely not an easy, um, an easy hill to climb. Um, and I 
I so commend um, folks in the conservation movement who are making very sincere and, and um, hard fought efforts um, to, to go up this hill. Um, and so what I'm trying to communicate is sort of what I see as overarching um, uh, some of this dialogue and, and that I think sort of needs to be flagged moving forward and how do we do that in, in a constructive way and, 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 and a good way and that's sort of what I'm gonna get to next. So I'll give it back to Deb. Cool, Danica and I go to a lot of meetings together, but rarely do we ever have a chance to actually engage with each other. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just uh, tell a, a brief story that relates to that question of, are people actually kind of ready as conservation movement in my view, is anybody actually really ready, um, really ready for our, our knowledge? Um, and, and I'll just say that by, by telling this, this brief story. Um, so a number of indigenous scholars, I think it was like 217, like three years ago, were brought to Congress, which was at Ryerson at the time, to kind of ask that question, because the academy through the funding agencies became, they were always were kind of interested in indigenous knowledge systems, but it was like front and center. And they could never figure out, is indigenous knowledge the same as saying indigenous knowledge systems? And I'm like, no, it's not. Um, so they, the, the question that they posed to us, and we had like two minutes to try to answer it, was... <laughs> How do we think indigenous knowledge should be, you know, incorporated and addressed in the uh, addressed in the academy? And everybody kind of tried to do their best to try to talk about this in, in, uh, in, in, you know, their two minutes. And I just said, well, we're still asking the same questions we asked for decades ago. Surely, like we've learned something. And then it was Zoe Todd's turn because um, I want to give her credit for this because it was like she just said, I don't think you're ready for our knowledge. Like really, is the Academy really ready for our knowledge? Because we've been sharing it all this time. And here we are. Um, is the Academy actually, or anybody actually really kind of ready, uh, ready for our knowledge? And, um, and I'll give her an example of that um, in, in work, uh, work that I was doing in, in water. So part of understanding water um, from the work that I've done over the last couple of decades is it's, um, considered to be living, having its own agency. M.A. Craft would talk about it as being a legal actor. And, uh, and I was doing training with some youth and they were learning how to do like water sampling kind of stuff, like some kind of youth initiative. And uh, science-y, techy types that they brought in to teach them the science-y, techy, uh, like the, the IT kind of stuff, um, just said, well, we actually don't think that's the case. Like, when did that ever happen? I said, I don't know, every time that we've gone to meetings and said that the ontology of water is that it's a living entity, we don't actually govern it, it's not a resource, it's not a commodity, it's not private property, and yet that's still how it's considered in legislation and governance. Anyway, their mouths dropped open into a big, oh, I go, yeah, and we've been telling you for decades. So that's an example of what we have been sharing, we have been telling people in all kinds of different forums uh, our knowledge, but people haven't been really ready to try to accept it and understand it and work with it on its own terms. Um, so I, I, and I still remember that moment sitting there going, she's right. Like it isn't just, the onus isn't just on indigenous people to try to figure this out. Other people, uh, including ourselves, because we have to decide what we're ready to share because there's been a lot of harm and people have to be kind of ready there too, but people have to actually be ready for this. Um, uh, some of you, like I sort of recognize some of the names up there. I don't know how many panels I've been on for like a grand total of 10 minutes trying to explain what Indigenous knowledge is and how we understand it. And somehow um, that has to make sense to people to try to figure out how they're then going to try to um, incorporate that into their work. So, so to me, that's probably one of the biggest questions that we don't ask ourselves. Um, and I was completely impressed with the question. I actually designed a project when Shirk did that call for Indigenous knowledge and, uh, and reconciliation research, what does that look like? Well, that was our question. And we asked uh, elders, grandmothers and grandfathers what they thought needed to be done for people to actually do the work to prepare themselves in order to be able to engage um, with Indigenous peoples and their knowledge so that our knowledge just doesn't end up in some little box with some like bullets about our knowledge, especially um, the stuff they can't deal with, which is usually spiritual knowledge or what they think is spiritual knowledge. Um, and that's actually law. A lot of the times I go, that's actually law. Like you're not even recognized it as law. It's like in a little box and some bullets. So people don't know what to do with it. And there's so much work even at that level that has to be done. So that's her insight. I can't take credit for that. <laughs> um, I'll just say, again, asking the right questions and being able to understand indigenous knowledge systems 
on its own terms. And, and that to me, that's not as insurmountable as that seems because I'm thinking, I went through the whole system from junior kindergarten up to getting my PhD and I learned somebody else's system. I can teach environmental impact assessment. I had to learn somebody else's worldview and ontology um, and learn how to function in it. And not only that, excel in it. So I'm thinking, I think other people can learn um, <laughs> because we have to as Indigenous people all the time. Um, we're always constantly confronted. I mean, maybe because we're constantly confronted with it and other people, when I'm teaching, I may be the only Indigenous person that they're ever in contact with probably in their whole life. Like that's another reality that I have to, um, I have to deal with. So I just thought I would end with that, uh, um, the challenges section, because I think if we don't ask the right questions, Anna asked a great question, um, and, and I think there's still a, a lot of work that has to be, there's a lot of work that's been done, and then how do you um, build on that? For this last little bit, before we get into uh, fielding um, questions, was just where the opportunities lie. What are the opportunities uh, in terms of the future? Where have we seen some real bright spots? Um, what does this mean in terms of reconciliation or self-determination for Indigenous people? Um, and I'll just turn it over to, to Danica to begin. Um, to begin that conversation. Sure. So, um, so obviously, you know, in the context of the CRP, um, you know, the promotion of Indigenous protected and conserved areas as um, something that is Indigenous-led is um, of uh, great importance uh, moving forward. And, and I think in that context, you know, um, the vision that the Indigenous Circle of Experts had around what the possibilities and the potentiality was around IPCA's um, Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas was, was, really, um, was really so high level in terms of um, finally seeing um, appropriate recognition of, of, uh, of Indigenous, uh, indigenous systems of indigenous governance, of indigenous law, as, as mentioned by Deb, of indigenous knowledge, indigenous language, um, indigenous space and place. Um, so I think all of that sort of um, tied into um, what we really felt were the possibilities around IPCAs. And something that's really interesting that's emerged is we have seen you know, some amazing examples. Of, um, of, of how this can be done and, and, and what the possibilities are and, and sort of models moving forward. Um, and, and, you know, um, I don't know if our colleague Steve Mita is on the line right now, but um, I can never know how to pronounce it properly because I'm Cree, but let's okay, um, just won the Equator Prize uh, for the establishment of their protected area. Um, and and I think you know um, there are, are are other emerging examples of what's possible. Um, I think though that um, we also have to be, as I mentioned, aware of the context that um, Indigenous peoples are are functioning within, and so that even um, there's sort of this, this dissonance that's emerging for me um, where we have some amazing initiatives that are establishing wonderful um, models and standards moving forward and then we have everything else that has come before that has never been addressed or remediated in terms of its impacts on indigenous peoples and so um, it's sort of like um, going in a time warp if you look at like um, established national parks and how they treat indigenous peoples versus like, you know, a, a newly established indigenous protected and conserved area. Um, and, and we are still continuing to see, as I mentioned earlier, you know, ongoing criminalization of indigenous peoples vis-a-vis -vis protected areas in this country. Um, and we are also seeing continued peripheralization and exclusion of indigenous peoples from decision-making over their lands and territories, which were usurped or forcibly taken um, for the purposes of protection and conservation in Canada. Um, and so indigenous peoples basically having no role in decision-making um, or perhaps maybe um, you know, an ad hoc advisory role um, or something that has no real um, you know, legitimacy in the context of decisions that are made about how lands and waters are stewarded, stewarded and managed. 
um, and, and, and animals and, and you know, other resources, I suppose you could say. Um, and so I think um, one of the sort of um, lights that I've, that I've reached towards in, in my own journey in this, in this work um, is the idea and the approach of ethical space. Um, ethical space is something that um, was originally um, described by uh, Willie Ermine who is a Cree thinker, um, who was also a professor at First Nations University. I'm not sure if he's still there or not, but um, he wrote a paper in 2007, which I believe is available online. You can Google him, um, Willie Ehrman in Ethical Space. And he wrote a paper that um, was really seminal in sort of, um, um, you know, how we have thought about inter-societal relationship building um, moving forward. Uh, and, and it's been adapted um, through different iterations um, as I've seen it raised and, and thought about in different contexts. So I myself have worked, um, I've had the privilege of working with elders, um, in particular in the province of Alberta and Treaty 6, 7, and 8 um, on ethical space in the context of health, in the context of conservation, in the context of climate change and other topics. And um, and in all those conversations, ethical space has sort of provided me with a very useful way of thinking about relationship building, not just um, sort of between and amongst Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, but also sort of um, in trying to make that connection back to strengthening and elevating Indigenous systems, whether that's law, language, knowledge, what have you. Um, and in um, ethical space is something that is uh, intended to reframe uh, the dialogue that happens between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. And so it's intended to elevate Indigenous systems as a whole um, and not in a piecemeal way. And, and it's intended to apply and make functional those rights and standards that I was referencing earlier. So things like treaties, agreements, other constructive arrangements, the UN declaration, uh, the TRC calls to action, um, Canadian jurisprudence and constitutional rights, et cetera. And this also would include sort of emerging standards within the context of conservation. The conservation movement has by no means been static and I don't want anyone to think that I've been trying to describe it as that. Um, it, things are very dynamic and, and changeable right now, especially in the context of broader discussions around, um, you know, biodiversity targets, um, you know, that, um, that are finishing up this year and, and into 2030 and beyond. So, um, so I, I really see ethical space as uh, has a, having a great potential moving forward. And I'll hand it back to Deb. Thank you, Danica. I don't think I have anything to uh, anything to add there if we're ready to field um, questions. Because I, I look at some of the questions and I think some of them were in some of the notes for the the last part in terms of opportunity. So maybe if we just have the opportunity um, to just use the rest of the time for a dialogue, so that we make sure there's time for uh, a closing prayer. Yeah, sure. Um, would you like me to just jump in and share some of the questions we've received? Sure, and then redirect them so three of us aren't like yelling into the mic at the same time. We won't be doing that, but you know what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Um, so maybe I'll combine two of the questions we've received. So one was around whether um, Indigenous knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, is individual or collective or both, and then how can we we better understand and communicate the role of spirituality in Indigenous knowledge systems. So I wonder, um, is it okay if maybe Marilyn um, would like to share some reflections on that before we go to Deb and Dan again? Yeah. My machine. <laughs> you got it. I've been listening to our, our young women here and you really are sacred to this society, both of you. 
sacredness and how you walk and how you think and what you are learning. So I'd like to acknowledge that. And I'd like also to say quickly, hello, Marilyn B. Um, in terms of um, where I am in my life, um, I'm born and raised here on the waters. And it occurred to me one day as we do the spirituality and asking um, through a younger lifetime about this traditional knowledge and land base, the historical knowledge. Um, and as I was becoming more involved in that, I felt like I was living a falseness because I was living in city and great comfort in my um, home surrounding my home. And uh, that is what inspired us to leave city, to come back to live in a little bit more comfort zone than what I grew up, but I can manage. So for me, just exampling of where I live, I'm on an island, so come winter and, uh, and spring when that ice comes and goes, we have quite a walk to go down the island. It's heavy terrain and then we need to cross in a rowboat to uh, go up, walk on the road to get our car. Um, that's not much different. The, the, uh, the difference in yesterday and today is that we have cars and we have a little bit better uh, non-tippy boats to cross that little narrow than that cold water season. And as the work progressed in reclaiming uh, knowledge of our people here, we became very involved in other discussions. Should we record? What should we do? Because all of this consultation and visiting with one another territories and, and our peoples, um, it, it, got, it, it was quite a question, no photographs and all this stuff. And it occurred to me one day as uh, I was out working on a team up on the, uh, the Mississippi or today they know that as the French River. And in that territory, in that waterway, the water highway, the connection of thousands of years, uh, the people had great gatherings just like we're having today. And yes, they did record it because they left behind the messages on the wall of the rivers and, and creator has put some very sacred sites there to indicate something. And some of those sacred sites from creator have just uncovered in the last few years. So when you ask such a question, there is a place for all of this to fit because we have so much. How many people are on this uh, visiting circle today? And each one of us are so much in age. And when you, if we're all telling the truth how, we, how old we are, that's how much experience we have together. And when you add it up, it's greater than 110. We're in the forever category. And even just sitting in the calls of the circles, either in the physical or in borrowing the air um, from our men, the keepers of that air and the sky world, the fire society, they are allowing us to talk in their ethical space as those caretakers right now. And, um, you know, we have to be very grateful. We just celebrated their existence and their role in the community of family of being fathers and grandfathers and such. So for us, when we have the opportunity and each and every one of these homes here, there are children, physical ones and ones that have left the nest. So we always have that um, understanding. And in relationship where we are in the moon cycle right now, uh, we are still in the third doorway, coming up to the fourth doorway of Odom and Gaze's a strawberry moon, acknowledging that new life, that heart, the beauty of that gift. And secondly, when we come up talking about the young children and acknowledging them, so does that creation in terms of the Muskokum and Gaze's, which is going to come July 5th. And that is the raspberry moon. And it, when, that, when you pick that raspberry from the umbilical cord, there is a little cup in there and that acknowledges your children and the women who are still of children bearing time 
we give you thanks because you are bringing new knowledge keepers to this world and you are the caretakers. The combination of all of what we've talked about here and had the pleasure through our two young women is tremendous. But when you look at where did we come from and where are we going, we know what the elders and the ones long before us have told us and left behind. And it is now your turn to carry combination. The picture gets bigger, so I'm very grateful to all the knowledge holders in your age society. Very grateful. Miigwech. Miigwech, Marilyn. I'm not sure. Deb or Danica, would you like to address that question? Danica, did you want to give it a shot first, the individual versus collective? Sure. Um, so I think, um, I think it's a, it's a really important question and, um, and it's one that has proven really confusing because there's a tendency um, to try to think about individual and collective, um, individually and collectively held knowledge in the context of, of rights and of systems as well. And, and this can also relate to sort of how knowledge keepers and knowledge itself is protected moving forward. And, and I'd like to start by saying that, that Indigenous knowledge has its own protections within its own system, um, built into its own system. And so, and so, um, so it's not just us sort of worrying about, um, you know, how Indigenous knowledge is so, quote unquote, treated in the context of, of mainstream systems, i.e. through intellectual property protections or privacy or things like that. Um, and, and, and that's sort of where I think um, the systems clash happens because um, what we see is that people sort of struggle um, to understand indigenous knowledge and indigenous knowledge systems from their own lens. And so there's a tendency to try um, to, um, to describe it in ways that's understandable or cognizable to the system that we're working from. And for sure, this, this, this distinction between individual and collectivity is, is precisely that. It's part of the lens of the mainstream. Um, and and um, for sure, we see that emerge, for example, in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That is the first UN standard that has ever emerged in the history of the UN. It was the first one to talk about collectively held rights in the context of a human rights instrument. Um, all the previous human rights instruments were totally about individual rights. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was the first one to try to tackle collective rights. Um, similarly, we've seen a little bit more progress um, in other fields and environment internationally, say under the UNFCCC um, in the climate change um, conversations around bringing more of an understanding of what collectively held rights are. Um, but that is sort of what it brings to my mind when I think about this distinction between whether knowledge is held individually or collectively. And, and it's difficult for me to continue because my son is just waking up, so I'll have to hand it back to Deb, sorry. That was great. Um, I think what, I, I hadn't really, really been aware of that um, between the human rights and the uh, UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, so that's really helpful in, in understanding how it's part of coming from a different, a different kind of lens. The, the other thing that I guess my, my gut instinct was, that's just so binary. And, and I think that in you know, our worldview, in a Shabbat worldview, indigenous worldview is it's not, things aren't so binary kind of in that way. It's either one or the other. It's like, it's got to fit into, like there's a line and it's going to fit on um, either side of that. I think that, um, and also it, within the context of rights rather than responsibilities, if you orient things, orient the conversation to responsibilities, that's where I see like the two of them actually being kind of one and the same. Like I don't have the appropriate metaphor for what that would look like other than you kind of look at the snail shell and like one could be individual rights and the other collective, but they're part of the same whole, but they can also, you know, be delineated. That's just what's coming to mind probably because I was watering the garden this morning and I saw some snails and was looking at their shells. 
or slugs, whatever they were. Um, and so when I think about, um, so we're individuals. So for me, I would have my name, my clan, where I'm from. So I would have obligations and gifts that were, that I get, that I have, that I have an obligation and responsibility and duty to um, live up to. That's not really on somebody else. That's on, on me to live up to these responsibilities. Um, and then there would be collective, and that's at different scales. So I would have these collective obligations and responsibilities that are associated with the clan that I'm part of, but other people are part of that clan too. Mm -hmm. So they, they have those as well, and we have to make it a point to know, for us it's uh, the bear, Makwa, so we have to know all about the bear, the ecology, its biology, you know, what it needs to live and to flourish. Um, and then it gets scaled up to like the nation level. So then you have, so then, it, so it's, it's a really different way within our own thinking and our own society way of thinking about that. I'll, say, I'll call it a dynamic um, as opposed to attention or a binary in, in the way that uh, Danica talked about it. And it's going to vary. Like that's going to vary. Like Mega Mama might have a different, have a different conception of what that looks like. Um, so it's, it's, so there's no like one kind of answer to that other than to try to, you know, take the cue from Danica and say that um, moving beyond kind of like the rights framework, which is critically important and trying to think about a different lens and in indigenous sense, it thinks about this in a, in a non-binary kind of way. We can think binary, but that's not kind of like the automatic kind of response to these kind of things. Um, so somehow that kind of answers that, uh, that question. In terms of how to deal with spirituality, like um, part of this work that we did to try to figure out indigenous knowledge systems, are we asking the right questions, is that what came out of that is similar to what Danica said, like we have our own frameworks for dealing with that. None of this is new. Those were questions that we had to ask ourselves before because any knowledge can be abused, which happens to a lot of our knowledge when it's exter uh, shared externally, but it also happened internally when you actually look at a lot of our stories because we weren't perfect. We are constantly learning. Um, we had the change, we had to deal with challenges. So our own protocols, uh, how we govern our own knowledge, um, dealt with those kind of um, situations. So, so we already we already have that built into uh, into our systems. Um, I think what's what's happened is, and Danica's touched on this before, is we haven't really been given support to deal with, to be able to um, articulate and, for lack of a better word, because I I hate saying this, document and codify what our own systems are. So the way that a lot of indigenous nations respond to these. Um, demands that Danica talked about is we, we develop traditional knowledge protocols, we develop research protocols, but we're not, but a lot of people don't have them either, because that helps people kind of work through those kind of questions. What's appropriate at this time to share or not share or, you know, and then it could change depending on who would whoever showing up next and, and, and wants mm -hmm. knowledge. So communities really need to be supported to be able to, to really bring forward um, these frameworks that existed for thousands of years that had to grapple with these questions. Um, and that's part of what Danica said about lifting up our own, our own systems, which was one of the major recommendations that came from this other work that we did with elders, was they said, we need support for our own systems. Because right now, because of colonization and other processes, those things that haven't been undone yet, um, it's very difficult to have people to always come to the meetings uh, all the time because we just don't have we don't always have that kind of um, capacity, especially now during COVID-19, where all staff are like on deck dealing with the situation in the communities. They don't really have a lot of time to respond to, um, to proponents. Um, a lot of Indigenous nations are in a state of multiple crisis. So it's, it's hard to like carve out the time for someone's research project, right? So, or to develop these kind of um, protocols. So that's, that's part of the work that, that I think others can have to try to support uh, Indigenous communities so we can negotiate and navigate through these conversations because there's no there's no right answer to this It's not like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and then you ask the computer this question and it pops out 42 That was the other thing I learned from elders. There's no like quick answer to this like it's it's a negotiation It's like constant. It's like conversation the de relationship develops over time um, And we need the space to be able to do that um, And I think the ethical space that Danica talked about is one of the ways uh, one of the ways to do that, other models are the Gaswenta, the two Rwampa model, dish at one spoon model, treaty models. I remember with the elders when we said, is there like a way that we should be approaching like traditional knowledge when Ministry of the Environment comes and wants it for water governance? 
And they just looked at us kind of like we were idiots. And they said, that's already kind of laid out in the treaties. The relationship's already laid out there. Um, so why are you asking us this question that we already answered however many decades or 100 years ago? So, so those need to be kind of brought to life in order to, um, in order to be able to be on this, be able to negotiate and have these kind of really um, important kind of uh, relationships and dialogue um, and discussion. All I did, Danica, was just sort of expand a bit on what you've said and wave my hands a little bit more for emphasis. So <laughs> your hands are busy now. Hi, Pablo. Uh-oh, I made him shy. They just woke up shy. That's great. Thanks, Deb. Um, so we're at time now. It's 3.30 now in Eastern Standard Time. Um, so I'm wondering if it might be a good time to wrap up, but I have recorded all of the questions that we haven't had a chance to get around to. Um, so maybe we can, you know, Deb and Danica and I can connect um, and figure out if there's different resources that we can share to try and respond to some of these questions offline afterwards um, so that we don't miss an opportunity to carry on that conversation. Um, so I just want to thank everyone. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Danica. Thank you, Deb. It's been such a rich uh, learning opportunity. It's been such a wonderful afternoon to spend with all of you. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are hoping to host these sessions throughout the summer. We're looking at one to two a month. So please watch our website as we start to firm up details. We'll post there. We'll post on social media. Um, if you get our partnership newsletter, we'll, we'll share it there. So um, thank you very much. And without further ado, awesome. um, yeah, I was just going to pass it off to Marilyn. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Good. Um, Kristen are, are uh, sitting together today. Um, what I didn't say when I was speaking a little bit earlier, the way that those records uh, remain with us today and probably through a technology that's much better than our, 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 um, our computers and all of those because they do have grown from um, one size to small size, but we can still communicate. So I just want to acknowledge the pictographs, the petroglyphs, and uh, the writings that remain on the walls, the sacred gifts from creator as they are, as um, something that we don't, we, we talk about not knowing language, but we're definitely trying. And there's uh, more than one language on this planet. Um, everything has a voice and so does the land and water. So in saying that, I'm going to say miigwech for the people that came to sit in today's circle and acknowledge the men for allowing us to borrow the airspace so we can communicate with one another. Uh -huh.